The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Ilya, welcome back. Thanks. We had a uh, nice long longest vacation i can think of in a long time two weeks off it's great i've never i don't know that i've ever had two weeks off but as a freelancer when you have two weeks off you just start panicking (laughs) i I should say i've often had two weeks off but it it was like uh, this is not a vacation a vacation would be like i can relax it would be like two weeks of scrambling and where's my next paycheck coming from you know i think that a lot of freelancers feel like the surest way to get work is to book a two-week vacation that is non-refundable because pretty much oh, yeah. that seems to be the way that people get jobs is murphy murphy was a filmmaker murphy's law says uh, book vacation if you want to work <laughs> and uh <laughs> so before we get into everything i wanted to bring something up i got uh, a call a few days ago from Kay's alatracci and uh his significant other christina lobata and Kay's uh was like catching up on our podcast and he said that we did him dirty when we were talking about iatsi and residuals and oh. so he and christina yeah. uh very patiently corrected my assumptions about iatsi and residuals which is to say iatsi does do residuals in a roundabout way, but it's only in your pension. And also, like, let's say you're the editor on Avatar 2. You don't directly get residuals for the money Avatar 2 makes, but, like, your residuals go into a giant pool that one day you will pull a pension out of. And Mm. uh, to which I say, that's not a great way to do residuals. I'm not going to say it's not a residual. I just disagree with how they're going about doing it. That doesn't sound particularly transparent. That doesn't sound like anyone has a clear accounting then of, of, of where and, their, their dollars are coming and from. And please, I know that a lot of IATSE cinematographers listen to this and people involved in IATSE. I would love to hear from someone with an authoritative voice. We'll bring you on the show. You can explain it to us. We're not going to get argumentative or anything. I'm just personally very, very interested in, in how this works because a uh, communist that I am, I, I think <laughs> everyone should get a piece of the residuals if you worked on the thing. And I'm not saying that you know, like a company grip who came in for one day should make the same residual as the cinematographer. But maybe if the company grip who came in one day earned one point towards getting one tenth of what the cinematographer got or one one hundredth still over a career of doing that stuff, you could have a, a war chest of residuals. And there is enough money flying around the business that I, I feel like it could support it a little bit better. But who am I to say? I don't know. I'm no mathematician. Hey, well, uh, speaking of communism, do you remember Indigent? Uh, it was oh a, yeah, y- independent it, digital entertainment. That's right. I remember it was, the, we had Ellen Curas on the show, and she shot uh, Personal Velocity, which is uh, one of the really good Indigent films. Uh, uh, do, exactly. Do go on. Well, it was sort of the brainchild of uh, Gary Winnick, who I'm sorry to say I think passed away several years ago, but uh, it lasted until about 2007. Yeah, they were and making like hundred thousand dollar digital movies. They were, but their sort of revenue share model to all the people who worked on it was that everyone got a percentage, everyone got a point. So if you were yeah. that company grip who came in and worked for a day, it might be a fraction of a fraction of a percent, but there there was like down to the PA, everyone got a piece of it. That was sort of like, it was very communistic. I, I, it was a, I completely know where you're going with this. Please go, do go on. All I was going to say is that... Uh, <laughs> It turned out that that business model, I guess, wasn't the best business model. Well, I should say it didn't it didn't continue. It lasted until 2007. Uh, but, you know, I believe that because of that, there are people still getting residuals from those movies, from those those properties. Well, I recently saw an interview and it was Randy Tom, who was on the show, mm-hmm. posted a, a clip of this interview from The Hollywood Reporter talking about Ben Affleck on the air movie and uh, how basically the company that he's set up does that now. Oh, Wow. I didn't realize that. I appreciate anyone who's picking up the torch and is going to try and run with that again. I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't believe that goes down to every single person on the crew. And I think that if it went to, let's just say, all the crew heads, that would be a market improvement. If it went to DP, gaffer, key grip, editor, wardrobe designer, you know, all the big, you know, like in my perfect utopia, it would go to everybody. But you know, I just think that that's a that's a better way to go. So, Ilya, who is on the show today? 
Uh, on the show today is Michael Zink. Uh, Michael's day job is a vice president over at uh, Warner Brothers. He uh, He's the vice president of emerging and creative technologies. He also is serving with Simpty, and he is sort of the chief advocate for this thing called Filmmaker's Mode, and we talk all about that uh, coming up uh, right after our, oh, our close focus. So this is going to be something that we never do, which is an all-tech interview. This is all-tech. It is, but it's a little bit different than our usual sort of tech when we talk about stuff, because we usually talk about camera tech or lighting tech or production tech of some sort. And this is really on the consumer side. This is on the consumer electronics front and something that anyone who's got a television set, or I should say a relatively modern television set, or uses streaming services like Amazon Prime, uh, they may have come across this thing called filmmaker mode, which is designed to show you more of what the creative intent was. Uh, I I know Michael through the ASC. He is an incredible fellow and and very technical, and we really get into the nitty gritty. And I'm a very, actually very happy with this interview. But if for some reason you are just completely averse to any sort of technical conversation or that sort of thing, this might be the episode that you skip. If you are a consumer electronics person, if you are interested in home theater, or if you are interested in understanding the artist's intent and sort of what's going on behind the scenes and the efforts of many, many people to make sure that you don't have the smooth motion and some of the other uh, sort of... Wait, wait, <laughs> you don't like the smooth motion? No, uh, just just <laughs> flat, just a flat no there, 100% no. And you know what? Turns out I'm not alone. There's a, quite a few people out there who don't believe that the electronics company should be messing with the director, the director of photography, the, the studio's intent on how that movie or television show looks. And there's been enough buy-in now from different parties, different interested parties in all this, that we're getting closer and closer and closer to making sure that what the directors, what the cinematographers wanted to have seen can be seen in people's homes now. And I think that this is a really good interview for anyone who's interested in that, who wants to know a little bit more than they did five minutes ago. I'm very excited to find out why I should turn smooth scan off on my television. Actually, (laughs) I I will cop to every uh, Christmas when I go to my in-laws house, I take it upon myself to turn smooth scan off their television and and to set it up so that movies look like movies on there as best I can. Rather than the evening news. Yes, that's that's uh, that's a good idea. So, Ben, uh, what is our close focus today? Well, we have a doubleheader bummer close focus, but I feel like it's kind of important. So we lost two cinematographers while you were out of town. And honestly, I blame you. What? Um, It's your fault. When you they were if I if I hadn't gone out of town, everyone would still be alive. Is what you're saying? Yeah, butterfly effect, man. Um, No, we lost. uh, Firstly, the great Bill Butler. Mm. And, you know, we've never had him on the show. I wish we'd had him on the show because he was still shooting uh, his last credited cinematographer uh, credit is in 2016. So not long after we started, he hung it up a little bit. But this is the guy who shot. eh, Let let me just read a couple of little credits. Yeah. Yeah, One one or two that that you might have heard of. Jaws. Never heard of it. Uh, um, (laughs) One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, incredible. Yeah, absolutely. All time favorite. That's great. Grease. Yeah. Uh, Rocky 2. I don't know about Rocky 2. He did a bunch of the Rocky movies. He did Biloxi Blues. He did the the original Child's Play, which is near and dear to my heart, the original Chucky movie. Graffiti Bridge for for Prince. Uh, Hot Shots. This guy was, was, so like his first cinematographer credit is in 1962. And his last cinematographer credit is, what, seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, he shot a few things for Spielberg. He, sh- he shot Stripes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Bill Murray. It just goes on and on and on. He also shot a TV series that's I love that history is forgotten about called Good versus Evil, which was actually called G versus E. Mm-hmm. Uh, Did you ever see he, Capricorn One? I have seen Capricorn One. Yeah. It just goes on and on and on. And he shot, oh, The Conversation. Oh, sure. Arguably one of Coppola's best films and Coppola, I would say, being like the gold standard in film directing of his era and the conversation. That's like the kind of thing that you, that they showed us in film school and we all loved it. Anyway, amazing guy. His work speaks for itself and our cinema wouldn't be what it is today without him. Agreed. He, uh, he, I didn't know him, but I know many, many people who did. And I'm really sorry to hear about his passing, but it entirely unfair for you to blame me. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, fine. Okay. I'll, I'll take that one off of you. So the other part of our double header bummer here is someone who I actually knew, uh, Jacques Heitken. Oh, wow. Um, uh, yeah. Jacques yeah, Heitken. 
We, you and I had talked about having him on the show several times. Yeah, yeah. He actually said he would be on the show. I didn't know that he was uh, dealing with health issues. And he kind of said he wanted to come on the show when he had something bigger to talk about. Uh, a pretty storied career. Uh, to me, one of the things that really stood out was he shot a bunch for Wes Craven, most notably the original Nightmare on Elm Street, which is just beautiful and haunting and, and wonderful. And I mean, if you look him up, most of his stuff was genre. And I hope I'm not talking out of school at all. When I worked with Jacques, I was the assistant makeup artist on Bloodsport 2. We were shooting in Thailand. The director on that was a complete jamoke who did not direct at all. It was on that film that I was like, oh, if, if this jabroni can wake up every morning and look in the mirror and call himself a director, then I guess I can go for it too, because I'm even without any professional experience, way better than this guy. But Jacques, I would say, took that movie, which had no right to look any good. Mm. And when I saw the final thing, I thought, I mean, basically, I think Jacques kind of directed it. I would say Jacques, in concert with the fight coordinator, Philip Tan, directed that, managed to make it look like a movie. And I remember I was sitting in the uh, in the lobby of the Kum Supan Hotel in Supanburi, Thailand. And, you know, I'd been saving it up for weeks. I'm like, you know, it's the first time that I'm like just kind of sitting next to him. And I was like, dude, just so you know, like Nightmare on Elm Street is like one of my favorite movies of all time. And if you hadn't shot that, I might not be sitting here. And oh, wow. uh, he turned to me and basically said he should be making much more prestigious films than what he was doing at the time. <laughs> oh, jeez. And uh, I think he liked doing genre movies. He, he made some just really brilliant ones. The Hidden which is a movie that I just straight up ripped off with Alien Raiders, by the way. Mm. Um, the Hidden is is a beautiful, brilliant horror movie directed by Jack Shoulder. Uh, he, I, I really think that he left, maybe as Bill Butler left an imprint on the world of like giant blockbuster movies, I feel like Jacques Heitken left a similar imprint on genre films. And uh, and he was a really nice guy and had a, had a great sense of humor. And our friend uh, who was on the show, Tony Libertori, actually worked with him a bunch because he did second unit on several of the Fast and Furious movies. Mm. So I, I thought he was an awesome guy. I actually feel like an, like an idiot for not forcing him and twisting his arm to come on the show. When I was doing a, an Indiegogo campaign for season two of 20 Seconds to Live, he threw in some money. I mean, like, stand-up guy. Definitely, uh, if you're a, a fan of genre films, you've seen his work. And even if you're not a fan of genre films, you've probably seen some of Jacques' work. And uh, he will uh, be missed. He's a great guy. I, I remember a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, a uh, Steadicam operator, and he worked with Jacques way back on a film called Wishmaster. And, oh, yeah. Uh, For Wes know, Craven. Yeah. And he told me wh- how great it was to work with him. And I know that he ended up working with him again after that. And I, I'd heard all these great things about him over the years from you and from him and from elsewhere. And yeah, I'm I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about his passing. This is, uh, you know, it's, it's let uh, me give you like a teeny tiny sample yeah. of, of what Jacques was able to do, because it kind of blows my mind. And I uh, I got this story from one of the ACs from uh, the original Nightmare on Elm Street. I'm pretty sure he was an AC on it. A guy named Krishna Rao, who went on to be a DP and a director. And uh, Krishna is a cool guy. And if you've seen, there's a, an iconic shot in A Nightmare on Elm Street where these little girls are playing jump rope and they're singing the one, two, Freddy's coming for you. And it's slow motion and the lights all bloomy. And, and uh, you know, there's like some kind of a haze filter or something like that on it. And in the, and the, sh- the camera is dollying around. And as it dollies, it goes into full speed motion, regular motion and becomes less dreamlike. So the bloominess goes away. And Krishna explained to me that the way Jacques achieved this was because A Nightmare on Elm Street was not a big budget film. And back then in the early 80s, they didn't have cameras that could ramp speeds anyway. So in order to do that, they had to kind of hack into the camera and attach some kind of a variac or something into the camera guts to, to ramp the motor. Sure. And yeah. in doing that, of course, because you're changing the film speed, they had to have somebody pulling the iris in addition to pulling the focus, in addition to somebody pushing the dolly. Add to that one more thing, the bloominess that today you would just dial it in and resolve and have it slowly go out. They had a really long filter made that was like full white pro mist on one side and clear on the other. And they had one more camera assistant slowly pulling that filter out of the lens over the course of the shot. I mean, like you just think about like having to the coordination of all those things to get that right in camera, because also the ability to do any of that stuff in post was so limited back then. It was all photochemical. So all had to be all had to be done in camera. And you probably don't know if you got it till you get it back from the lab, you know, because like what if the iris 
ramp went too fast or slow. And, you know, having a Variac running the camera, I'm sure that they must have tested the crap out of it to make sure that they knew exactly what it was doing. But still, it, it reeks of impreciseness. And yet that shot is worth it. It's brilliant. It's iconic. And when I think of Wes Craven and like the great things about him, I think about things like that shot. And I think about like the opening scene of Scream, which was, uh, you know, with oh, the sure. steady work, yeah, steady Dan work of, of Dan Neese. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just, you know, like but but like Wes Craven knew how to like push for perfection on that kind of a level. And Jacques was, uh, if nothing else, someone who was a hardline perfectionist, one of the most perfectionistic DPs I personally ever worked with. And uh, so anyway, I, I'll stop memorializing him and Bill Butler, but I just have enormous respect for both of these artists and uh, and they'll both be missed. Uh, yes, indeed. Their work will live on. We, we will be able to at least see some of these works that they've uh, they've done over the years. And I'm glad that we have that that opportunity. So, uh, Ben, without further ado, we should get to the interview with Mike Zink. So here it is. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. I'm joined now by Michael Zink, the president of the UHD Alliance. Uh, Welcome to the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, first of all, for our listeners who don't know, what is the UHD Alliance? So the UHD Alliance is an industry group that was founded in 2015. It was at a time when there was a lot of confusion in the market about what is Ultra HD, what does UHD actually mean. For some people, it was predominantly 4K resolution. For other people, like studios primarily, it was high dynamic range and wider color gamut. And the UHD Alliance was founded at the time in order to bring together the entire kind of entertainment ecosystem. Um, so we have members from the studio side, we have distributors, we have technology enablers, and ultimately display manufacturers. And the goal was to bring all of them into one group to help figure out what do we want to do in the market? Um, how can we create specifications that help audiences to know that what they're getting is the best experience? And the first kind of steps that the UHD Alliance did was release technical specifications in early 2016 um, for something they called Ultra HD Premium. And that was really focused on defining what is a quality viewing experience for consumers in their home. And it really set the bar of defining what Ultra HD really should be. And that included, it should be at least 4K resolution, include high dynamic range at certain brightness levels and certain black levels, and white color gamut, immersive audio, um, higher bit depth, and things of that nature. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the show and to talk about it, because I think there is a lot of confusion, predominantly in the consumer space, but also in the professional space. I don't know if you know, but I worked uh, at Dalsa on the first uh, 4K digital cinema camera. I was part of that whole team back in the early days. And I give a lot of credit to UHD becoming a thing because of NHK, Japanese public television, and all of the research and development that they sort of spearheaded early on. Uh, do you Do you directly, as part of the UHD Alliance, have relationships with NHK or some of the work that they did early on then inform the work that you guys are doing today? Yes and no. I mean, by the time the UHD Alliance got involved, um, a lot of the work that NHK did was long gone, essentially. They were off to um, a whole bunch, doing a whole bunch of other things already. But of course, a lot of the work that they did is in defining um, UHD in terms of UHD 1 and the UHD 2 profile that they defined in other more international kind of like real standard setting bodies. Mm -hmm. What we try to do with the UHD Alliance is really create more of a B2C type um, specification. Consumer electronics, yeah. Consumer electronics and being able to develop a logo program so that people understand, hey, this display has a certain logo so it meets certain criteria and I can expect a certain level of quality. I don't think that that was necessarily the goal for NHK. No, it was broadcast. It was exactly. his idea of standards for, for cinema and everything else. But so sh- shifting gears then to the consumer space, we're in the hot red camera screening room right now. We've got a 4K Sony projector behind us and on it is emblazoned these logos. And I'm sure that anyone who has like a 
uh, home theater receiver, audio video equipment, a flat panel TV, they see these logos that, you know, that, that explain they have, might have Dolby Vision or HDR or any of this stuff. Is part of your job to uh, standardize this at all, to make sure that everyone is talking the same language and that the metadata communication between these protocols and the electronics manufacturers all makes sense? Is, is that sort of in your wheelhouse? Yes, that's exactly what we were trying to do. We started on the just defining what Ultra HD should look like, and we came out with a logo at the time. The challenge was that the specifications we defined were actually fairly high bars to climb. So you end up with only a very small number of displays in the market that actually can, at least in the beginning, could meet that criteria. That's true, and they're very expensive. Very expensive, but what it also did is it established some sort of this goalpost for everyone else to say, okay, I may not be able to do it today, but maybe next year or the year after. So it really helped them in terms of developing their roadmap to figure out where do we need to take our products. And over the years, more and more models um, were able to accomplish it. We're now at a point where... Most manufacturers don't even use the logo anymore, but it still is used as this guidepost in terms of this is what we should do in order to develop a really good experience for consumers. Is any of the the work that you're doing about standardizing the handshakes that go on between things like uh, the HDMI protocols for the consumer electronics? Because uh, I am one of those people who has a rather complicated home theater setup with various devices that don't always communicate correctly with each other. And sometimes I've learned that this is all for copy protection to make sure that someone isn't illegally sending a high definition or ultra high definition video signal from a Blu-ray 4K uh, player or from one of their streaming services to a recording device. Does any of the work that you're doing get involved in the sort of like, hey, this is a legitimate purpose for the signal to pass through or not? Or is that completely outside? Is that the HDMI working group? Is that a, how, do, do you guys get involved in, in that at all? The Signaling itself is something that HDMI deals with. They specify it and um, they work with the different companies to make it happen. What we had done on the UHD Alliance side, though, is because we recognize a lot of the problems you're talking about, that especially when we started um, looking at UHD and particularly HDR, you take a player out of a box and you hook it up to a display you take out of the box and you connect them and you're supposed to get a certain image and oftentimes you don't get the right image. You get SDR when you're supposed to get HDR or you're getting 8-bit when you're supposed to get 10-bit or you're getting no picture at all. A blank screen, absolutely. Or maybe a screen with no sound or all kinds of other Exactly. uh, So what we were doing was an awful lot of interoperability ability testing over the last couple of years. And I recall the first time we did the testing, more than 50% of the things that we tested failed. Mm. And I think the last time that we tested it, um, which was pre-COVID still, we ended up seeing quite a bit of an improvement. There were still a lot of failures, but compared to where it was before, it improved quite a lot. And what we were able to do is, as an organization, we, of course, since we don't control those specifications, we can't force manufacturers to do something. But simply the fact that we were able to do the testing and have the data to go back to them individually and say, here's a problem that we identified, can you guys fix it? And a lot of them actually did, and I think that's ultimately a good thing for consumers. Definitely. Now, the real reason, though, I wanted to have you on the podcast and talk is about this thing called filmmaker mode. Filmmaker mode, I remember when it was first announced, it wasn't exactly controversial, but there has been controversies, which is, I think, where this is sort of born out of. I think perhaps maybe most famously, Tom Cruise made a public service announcement basically telling people to turn off the smooth motion that might be built into their television set and that they are you know, violating the creative intent of the filmmakers by watching the TV set in the wrong mode. And there have been memes that have gone around through social media of how to turn off the various smooth scanning and things that are that the, the TV manufacturers built in. And and default to turn on. Uh, tell me about how filmmaker mode actually comes to be and what it is. Of course. Um, I think what's interesting about this is, like you said, Tom Cruise was one of the fairly famous videos he did with Chris McQuarrie. But there were many other filmmakers before that that kind of like individually decried this motion smoothing and all sorts of other things that um, manufacturers are doing wrong. I think Reed Morano actually had some sort of a petition, online petition, in order to get manufacturers to just turn it off by default. Unfortunately, none of those things really work with manufacturers. Um, They just usually do whatever they can. The benefit 
benefit we had is that through the UHD Alliance, we had a lot of them as part of our organization. And when we developed our first UHD specs, we kind of had some very loose language in there to say, just please preserve creative intent, but we really didn't define what exactly that meant. Mm. So back in probably 2018, 2017, somewhere around there, I had a conversation with um, Christopher Nolan at some point, and he decried the same thing to me. And when we talked, um, I was like, look, we have something there. Maybe there's an opportunity to kind of like move that um, a little bit forward and use that organization, the UHD Alliance, in order to help drive that initiative. And that very quickly turned into additional conversations and additional filmmakers that were like, okay, this is really interesting. So we brought it to the UHD Alliance and said, this is something that the creative community really wants. And we really want to define something that isn't specific to one manufacturer, but is something that every manufacturer can do. So we set out on this journey and really defined kind of like three core tenets at the beginning. Um, we said, number one, we want to make sure that we define a picture mode that truly preserves the creative intent. And that means we want to make sure that the creative community, filmmakers, cinematographers, and so on, actually have a voice in it and they're able to actually participate. The second thing was we wanted to make sure that it's really easy for consumers. Mm. The one downside of the Tom Cruise video, if you've seen it, is... At the very end, um, is like the way to turn it off, go to Google, figure out what your TV model is, and then um, turn it off manually. That is not a good user experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's many consumers that will actually do that, that wouldn't have known to do it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the way we defined filmmaker mode was that each manufacturer implementing it has to do it in one of two ways. Either there's a physical button on the remote that makes it very easy for consumers to just push it. Click on, click off. Exactly. Or, which is our preferred mode, is um, an automatic switching method. Ah, okay. So, so metadata flags traveling in the signal that then tells the device time to switch, time correct. to change. Okay. So fortunately, most of the manufacturers, actually all except one, implemented the automatic switching, which makes it really easy. There's obviously still the opportunity for users to manually go in if oh, someone right. doesn't send the signal. If they but, really want everything everywhere all at once to look like the evening news they can turn that back on of and they can okay and i i mentioned that of course because it just won best picture so that that, 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 that you know you could insert any 24 frame video here if you want it to look like the evening news if you want it to have that sort of like uh, video game quality <laughs> no one's taking that away from you you can still do that with your television set i know that there are people out there who say that they prefer it I've never met these people, but I know that they exist. But that you are not taking away someone's ability to change the smooth motion extra effects that are built in there. And the electronics manufacturers, they all signed off on this. They, they spent a bunch of money R&Ding and coming up with these things because I'm sure their research found that people uh, you know, liked it or preferred it for some reason. And filmmaker mode turns it off, but doesn't take it away. You can still that overwrite. Is correct. Yeah, we would never want to take the right away for anyone to screw up their picture. <laughs> but <laughs> if you, everyone's going to have purple skin, we you're you're, you're going to make sure it happens. Yes, but what we want to do is make sure that um, consumers know this is the way it should be. If you don't like it, you bought the TV. You should be able to change it to your liking, and there's no judgment there whatsoever either. So. The third thing that we really were trying to focus on was making sure that it has a single name across all the manufacturers. Mm, yes, because it's very confusing when each one of them has their own trademarked, patented, true motion, smooth motion, jelly motion, whatever they, whatever they want to call it, but they have a, a name for it. And if you call it filmmaker mode, at least what, whoever comes along, they know what that means. Correct. And that actually was the biggest benefit that we had in convincing manufacturers to actually implement that. Because while there was quite some reluctance in the beginning, because they suddenly can't differentiate anymore. Um, because if one manufacturer has a movie mode, and another has a cinema mode, and another one has a true cinema mode, it's like, apparently that is better and com more competitive. If they are all called filmmaker mode, that takes that competitive advantage away. But the advantage that we kind of like showed them is that if we have a single name, we can corral the entire creative community behind that and they can help promote and market that mode as a feature. And that was something they found very compelling and why they ultimately ended up implementing it. 
And, and are you seeing that? Is the creative community coming out and, and forced to, to help support Filmmaker Mode? Yes. So when we launched it, we had a really interesting launch video uh, that's available on YouTube as well, um, where we had probably 16, 17, 18 directors and um, cinematographers that all went on camera and were kind of like promoting it. And what's interesting, we had kind of like at the end of this short little video, it's like we kind of like did this little montage with all of them together to tell people to watch it in filmmaker mode. But more so over the last um, year or two, what we started doing is every now and then kind of like work with filmmakers when new films are coming out and have them record some sort of PSAs that we can then distribute through social media channels so that some of the directors can actually reach their audience to tell them, here's how you should really watch it. And this way they can just promote filmmaker mode and it doesn't matter which display manufacturer people have in their home, they can still get it. All right. What are you going to say to the person out there who says... Filmmaker mode makes my screen too dark, or I don't know what the most common complaint is. I'm just going to assume that maybe like, uh, you know, actually maybe before I ask this question, it turns off the smooth motion. Uh, I know it does uh, some evening of the, the brightness controls and the levels. Is there anything else that filmmaker mode does that changes the appearance for, for people? Yeah, so what it ultimately does at the very core of it, it is turns everything off in the TV that is related to image enhancements. The whole notion is really whatever signal comes into the TV should be shown the way it comes in. The TV should not make any modifications. So that includes things like motion smoothing, which is like the big one, sharpness enhancement. Um, it makes sure that it's um, set to D65, mm -hmm. um, which I think usually makes a really big difference, that alone. Um, there's a whole bunch of other image processing things. Um, that and by D65, what do you mean? For our listeners who aren't familiar with So D65 is really the white point. So that's the white point that's being used in cinemas, that's being used for high dynamic range in the home. And what it really means is that um, the image is being changed to have the right colors. We, we have Max Planck to thank for this. Yes, the uh, it's the same exact concept for those of you who are uh, listening to this podcast who uh, understand uh, lighting, uh, understand you know the difference between color temperature of lighting. It's the same thing happening on your screen, and D65 will give you that uh, universal standard of white point that the consumer electronics industry has decided defines white, so at least you know that you're starting more or less at the right, the right place. Correct. Um, oftentimes, these televisions have very different white points that are oftentimes a lot more bluer, very blue. Um, yeah. So whenever you actually switch to D65, you see a much more warmer color. It's much more inviting and much more similar to what um, filmmakers actually see in the grading room. And I think that's where we started out is trying to define an environment that if people are watching it in a dimly lit room or in a dark room similar to a grading suite, watching it in filmmaker mode gives you the very close match to that. Now to your earlier question about what are the biggest complaints, yeah. the fact that it looks too dark is certainly one of the main complaints that we oftentimes get. And when we started out, the whole notion was, let's match what an optimal viewing environment would look like. That's a dim or dark a dim viewing room. room. That would be like a theater. That Correct. would be something like that. But a lot of people don't have their televisions in a light controlled room or they're trying to watch it during the day or with every light on and all the windows open the, the ideal environment for a movie then filmmaker mode is saying you you got to do something about where you've placed this screen correct at least at this point in time we did start um, a little while ago to actually look into the fact that reality is like you say people are watching it in very different ambient lighting conditions. And what we currently have defined in our specification is that we're encouraging manufacturers to implement ambient lighting sensors mm -hmm. so that they can then make adjustments if Smart it is adjustment. getting too bright. What we have not defined yet is what those adjustments should be. Um, a lot of manufacturers are kind of like doing that today. There's a few solutions out there, um, a lot of them proprietary. What we're working on right now is to try and figure out what kind of guidance can we give manufacturers to create some more parity between all of the different manufacturers and what they do in different ambient lighting conditions. Because you do need to make adjustments, otherwise you're not going to see much of a picture. Yeah. Would that override filmmaker mode? Would it be automatically? Would it come through the flags? Is it something you think you'd, that consumers would have to turn on and off this? ambient adjustment uh, on the fly sort of thing? 
I don't know where we will end up yet. Ideally, at least in my mind, I'm not a big fan of making consumers having to chase for things in menus and turning things on and off. Um, Since we already have a lot of the automatic signaling, I would imagine that a lot of the manufacturers will probably do the automatic adjustments as well Mm -hmm. and then give consumers an opportunity to manually turn it off. But I'm not sure where they will end up. It will very much be manufacturer-specific, probably. Filmmaker mode 2.0. So with, so with the auto speak. adjustment, yeah. Okay, so how do the electronics manufacturers feel about the rollout of filmmaker mode and the feedback from from customers? Are they uh, still on board with this? Do they they like this? Are they are they doubling down? Are they using it as a um, marketing tactic to convince people to buy their sets, or has there been more resistance? How, what's the reaction from the electronic part of the industry? It's interesting. It was a little bit of a shift. Um, it, in the very beginning, I think the, um, the manufacturers, we launched with three manufacturers, and very quickly thereafter at CES 2020, I believe, we added more and more manufacturers. And in the very beginning, I think they used it as a differentiating feature. I was there at that launch. <laughs> and over time, it changed quite a bit where I think we've seen over the last few years more and more and more manufacturers coming on board and implementing it, but not necessarily going to CES or other um, trade shows, promoting it as a standalone feature, which is kind of what we were hoping for because the whole goal for us has been it should become a checkbox item. It's something that each manufacturer or each display should have but shouldn't be anything that they are going out and say, this is a differentiating feature, because it isn't. And what's really encouraging for us is how many manufacturers are on board these days, and there's more and more coming um, all the time. And the other thing that was really helpful and very encouraging was fairly early on, especially two of the um, largest manufacturers like Samsung and LG Electronics, they implemented it right out of the gate on every single one of their models. So it did not become one of those highly priced features, but instead it is in every single model um, available. And that was something really important for us. Uh, you and I know each other through the American Society of Cinematographers, the, the ASC. Uh, can you talk a little bit how how is the ASC influencing or getting involved with the UHD Alliance or and filmmaker mode? Is this uh, something that uh, in a long term ongoing project for you? It has been. Um, we've actually been very grateful for the ASC to um, help us all along. When we started Filmmaker Mode, what I should probably explain a little bit is getting manufacturers on board and convincing them that this is the right thing to do. What really helped us was, number one, we did a survey to a lot of the industry folks, a lot of the creative community. We used the uh, ASC to reach out to um, cinematographers. We used the DGA to reach out to um, directors. We had the ICG to reach out to some of the international folks, to reach out to some editors, colorists, and so on and so forth. And the reason behind that was that we needed to show to the manufacturers that this isn't just something where one or two creatives have some sort of big statement every now and then and then it goes away but that this is really a groundswell and we got almost 400 responses in that survey and the interesting thing is that i think 95 96 percent of the people responded that this is a feature that's either important or really important and um, that really helped the manufacturers to see that okay, this is something that that really matters. What we then also did was reach out to consumers and say, if you have two identical TVs, but one also has a mode that preserves creative intent, which one are you more likely to buy? And turns out that um, I think it was close to 90% of consumers, and we asked 4,500 of them, said, yeah, I would buy something that has a mode like this. And among 4K TV owners at the time, it was like over uh, over 90%. So that helped them because they're ultimately, th- that's their audience. That's what they want to sell. So they could see that there's a feature that is monetizable. The ASC really helped us in reaching out um, to the cinematographers to, um, to get the feedback there. Like I said, it was one of the main things for us was we wanted to find something that the creative community actually helped develop. So it's not just some random people in a room coming up with something, but it's something that's actually created by the creative community. I, I got to ask you, because I know that this is probably a bit of a reach, and I'm guessing that most of the consumer electronics manufacturers don't want to go down this path. But one of the big complaints that I hear from the, the fellows at the ASC and the, the MyTech committee and uh, just people who I know in the industry who want to have a 
home television screen that closely resembles the screens that they're using on set or in post-production or in the theater uh, is calibration. And I think that there is a misconception by most consumers out there that the moment they take their television set out of the box, that it's calibrated and ready and that filmmaker mode is actually a calibration then for their display. So they're seeing it exactly how it's intended. But that's not the case. Filmmaker mode is not a calibration for that screen. It is turning off the stuff that removes creative intent, but is calibration something that the UHD Alliance in filmmaker mode is, is fighting a fight, or is that going to be never a winnable thing? We cannot convince consumer electronics manufacturers that they should give everyone a basic calibrated mode so when they take their set out of the box and they plug it in, they turn on filmmaker mode, that they see what everyone intended, the colors, the black level, the white level might still be way off. What do you have to say to the people out there who, who want that calibrated monitor experience in their living room? Get your, get your monitor calibrated? To some degree, yes. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Um, there, there's a number of different levels or different models that you have out there. And if you have an entry-level model, that display has very different just general capabilities uh, compared to a really high-end model. And either one of them, if you calibrate them, you can get them close, but they have different capabilities to begin with. But neither of them are calibrated right out of the box. And I don't know that there can be an expectation that manufacturers will ship fully calibrated displays. It's certainly not to a point where it is affordable to consumers. So I highly encourage people to calibrate their displays, but filmmaker mode is not a calibration tool. It's really just there, like you said, in order to turn off all of the other image processing that um, displays do. And you would still have to do your calibration on top of that, just like you would have to do it with any of the other modes out there as well. Because of this, uh, during COVID, we partnered with the top calibration company to the studios, and we are now selling LG monitors that are pre-calibrated to fulfill this exact need. And because during the pandemic, there were so many people staying home and watching a lot of television, uh, we also instituted a delivery service where you didn't have to do anything. You could literally order on our website, and we could be very enterprising, where we would get a brand new LG flat panel screen calibrated and then delivered. And the reactions that we got from people was, holy crap. This is amazing. The LGs in particular have qualities that I want to say are highly reminiscent of extremely expensive HDR displays that you might see in color grading suites uh, all over. Now it's specific LG models, but have you noticed a convergence of the, the home electronics screens constantly improving and getting to the point now where they really are rivaling some of the tools that are being used in post-production? I have. I mean, it's gotten so much better over the last decade or so. And what I credit a lot to it are these conversations and these collaborations, especially between Hollywood and the creative community and manufacturers. And I think UHD Alliance has been really helpful there of bringing a lot of that together and just educating each other. Um, I remember when I started at Warner Brothers, my day job, I had no idea, and that was like about nine years or so ago, I had no idea about what um, high dynamic range really was or how, how what it really means from a display perspective. And then I worked a lot with manufacturers to where they explained to me what are their concerns, what are their problems, what are they trying to solve, and things such as dealing with different energy consumption requirements. I never even thought of that, but that is what they're really worried about. And once you start listening to them and you start realizing what their issues are, then you can actually start figuring out, hey, how can we find a solution that helps us on the creative side and gets us much better pictures and also doesn't break your energy consumption problems that you're having from a regulatory perspective. But what that really led to is much more of these conversations happening and frankly, manufacturers seeing a lot of opportunities of providing their consumer level products into color suites, into color grading environments um, in the studio. And that really helped make their consumer level products better. And some of them are jumping faster on the bandwagon than others. And you see the results with, um, like you said, some of these implementations. I think Calman is now kind of like very closely integrated in LG. I know there's a whole bunch of other manufacturers that they implemented as well. So it's very easy for consumers to just calibrate their equipment or for services like use. It, it's relatively easy. You still have to invest hundreds of dollars in a probe and then software and everything else and educate yourself into doing it. So look, I encourage everyone to go out there and do that if they are interested in it, because you can absolutely do it with about 
eight hundred dollars, I would say, of, of equipment and and a limit of time. My business, which I, I will tell you, it was definitely sort of peaked during the pandemic. It's it's less popular now, but we would charge about four hundred dollars to uh, you know as a premium on top of whatever it was. So you wouldn't quite have to spend so much and that you get something delivered to you if you were leased within the production zone, basically inside of uh, you know Hollywood in the LA area. But I am very encouraged by the direction it seems to me. I feel like people are paying more attention with all of the different options that are coming with screens. I know, you know, I am hearing consumers talk about now for I think the first time HDR and talking about HDR 10 or versus Dolby Vision. And I heard people actually talking about this while I was in line at the movie theater, which was kind of amazing to me. Like I, I didn't necessarily expect that that would have infiltrated as much as it did, but there are certainly the cinephiles who when they go home, they pop in a movie or more likely it comes over a streaming service. They wanna make sure that they are seeing it the way it's intended to be seen. And I think that occasionally when when something like Game of Thrones comes along, and I, our listeners can't see your face, but you're grinning right now. But yes, when Game of Thrones comes along and pushes that envelope really hard, and there's those people who really don't have a television set set up in a room that is going to be capable of seeing you know, the very, very low illumination levels that, that are happening, it causes, like I want to say, not only does it cause memes and everything else, but it gets people talking about this. It gets people talking about like what was wrong with HBO. Turns out nothing was wrong with HBO. It turns out the problem was with yourself, but most people don't want to, of course, accept that. But once at least the conversation gets going and then people can go, oh, there's another way to watch this. I could have seen what was going on. And did I have to turn up the brightness on my TV? Maybe, but if you were in the right place, you you might not have had that experience. What is what is this sort of like pop culture? And I'm I'm using the term pop culture loosely here, of course. But any anything like that kind of goes out into the zeitgeist of people talking about the display and how their experiences with it. Are you are you hearing more conversation about this? Are you seeing more knowledge and more education, or do you feel like there's a long way to go? No, we're seeing a lot more of that, and frankly, a lot of that started happening a while ago when Amazon Prime Video started implementing, I think, probably a year or two ago into their service on the LG display, on Samsung, and so on and so forth, the automatic switching. So what that means is that if you're watching a film within Amazon Prime, every single time that you start playing a film or an episodic TV show, etc., that your TV will automatically switch into filmmaker mode. And that switch alone gets people thinking about it and um, start realizing, oh, what is the TV doing? And then they start educating themselves. What we did at this around the same time is, like I said, work with a lot of the filmmakers to do these PSAs so that if they start seeing something happening on their TV, they also at the same time start seeing some of their filmmakers promote that um, this is a good thing because... The last thing you want is for consumers to freak out. What is my display doing? Is this the right thing? What does this even mean? So the more we can do in order to educate them, in order to explain to them, yeah, this is something you should embrace. This is something safe to click OK to. And that alone, I noticed as well, has elevated the conversation. It's interesting, going back many, many years now, I remember one of the manufacturers within uh, our organization um, shared a statistic with us at some point and said that typically 80, 85% of consumers take the TV out of the box, they never go into the picture mode menu. What they did at the time is do something similar to filmmaker mode, but it had a very wonky name um, that no consumer would generally go in there. But whenever they took it out of the box, within the first few minutes of playback, it brought up a little window on the screen and say, hey, do you want to, to watch the movie in the right way? You should go to this specific mode. And what they saw is the statistic flip. Now you had about 90% of people that say like, oh, that's how I should watch it, okay. And that gave us a lot of inspiration and motivation to really go about and say, this automatic switching is the way to go because consumers generally don't watch content in the way that isn't right because they want to. They watch it because that's how it comes out of the box. They just don't know. So if you tell them, hey, here's an easier way and here's the better way to watch it, most of them are like, okay, that's I'm happy to do that. And to your point earlier, if they don't like what they see, they can make adjustments, but at least they're making adjustments from what it should be, not something completely arbitrary that comes out of the box. 
So, Mike, uh, tell me, where do you think this is going? I know that, like, you know, we're getting into the minutia a little bit. I know that HDR is uh, available through HDR10, which is one of the, the major formats. A competing format for HDR, Dolby Vision, is uh, is also in many people's, my, mine including electronics. Is filmmaker mode coming to Dolby Vision also? And as more modes uh, might exist or consolidate? Will filmmaker mode continue to uh, adjust? How, how do you see the future of, of these different uh, forms uh, integrating with what you guys are doing? That's a great question. So for us, it's always been the main impetus has been around how can we make sure that the messaging is simple for consumers? So everything should be, they should just be able to look for filmmaker mode and know that they're getting the right image, independent of what format is actually playing. Dolby is actually part of the UHD lines on our board as well. So we've been playing very nicely with them and um, they've been very supportive and we are very supportive of them as well. The challenge that you know when you're playing Dolby Vision is everything switches into kind of like their Dolby Vision, their own picture modes. And within Dolby Vision, they have a Dolby Vision Dark and a Dolby Vision Bright and sports and games and what have you. Only one of them, the Dolby Vision Dark, is typically is very much aligned with what filmmaker modes requirements are. We've been working with Dolby for quite a while now, and they recently um, updated their software packages for manufacturers where that version now is completely aligned with what filmmaker mode does. Fantastic. But furthermore, what we um, wanted to do is make sure that manufacturers are able to actually change the name of that and hopefully bring filmmaker mode to Dolby Vision as well. So that way you would be able to see Dolby Vision filmmaker mode and that way it becomes completely transparent for consumers to say, I don't care if I play HDR10 or Dolby Vision, whatever format is available, but I can see that everything is playing in filmmaker mode. The other benefit to that is it's not just about messaging um, consistency, it's also about the fact that Right now in Dolby Vision, consumers still have to manually pick which um, mode they want. The, I think the default mode is Dolby Vision Home, which makes it a little brighter, still has some motion smoothing on. But with the work that we've done with them, they are able to leverage the signaling that we are sending through filmmaker mode to then automatically switch into Dolby Vision filmmaker mode as well. So there's benefits for consumers all around. And again, for us, it's really important to just make sure that we can make it as simple as possible. And the other thing we're trying to do over the next year or so is figure out how can we assist in bringing it to more of the ambient lighting environments that consumers actually have. All right, I'm gonna ask you a question here. I'm not trying to get you in trouble. It's about the future and 8K. And I just figure I, I, you're, you're a good person to ask about this. And I have been probably on the same podcast already gone on record saying that 8K as a delivery format, not a display device, but as a delivery format, at least in this country, and probably most countries in the world will never happen. Like, I'm just calling it now, it's 2023, I'm saying it's not happening. I'm saying that everyone has galvanized behind 4K as the maximum potential delivery format to your home, be it a, a broadcast, a stream, a disc. Do you say bullshit? Do you uh, say that no, the, the arms race of resolution will continue and it will always continue and that we are going you know, to 8K or beyond? What is your feel on this? How do you feel about the future? And I'm gonna say, let's limit the future to the next 10 years. Um, I don't think you're gonna get me in trouble. I got myself in trouble on that one a few years ago. Um, taking off my UHD Alliance hat and putting on my Warner Brothers hat, um, we had done an actual study three, four, five years ago. Um, and it was in collaboration with the ASC as well, uh, in collaboration with Pixar and with Amazon and, and with LG, who had provided us one of the first real 8K displays. And what we wanted to do at the time is to compare 4K versus 8K. And we did it in a blind study where we had, I think about 140 people, some of them from the ASC, some of them just regular consumers. And we had a variety of content. We had content that was shot on film and scanned it, I think 10 or 12K at the time. Wow. Um, we had um, Pixar render out some of their scenes in actual 8K resolution as well. I gotta ask you though, what was the viewing distance for this? Where did people stand to look at these two screens? The viewing distance, I think we had two different rooms. Rows. They were five feet away, and the second row was it was it nine feet away or seven feet away? I okay. uh, I forgot. I'd have to I, look I'm it up. I already know the answer. I already know what you're going to tell me. You you, you finish the story. I already I know what the answer is. Okay. So it was an 88 inch display, and ultimately in the end, I think the conclusion for us was people had to rate um, 4K versus 8K. Was it the same? Slightly better, better, or much better? 
And the result ultimately was that overall it was, I think, marginally slightly better. <laughs> so that means if you have a scale from zero is the same, one is slightly better, better is two, and much better is three, it was somewhere in the 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 range. Yeah, and I'm I'm guessing that no one had an eye check before. Uh, before they actually doing, did. Oh, they did. They checked everyone's eyes. We checked everyone's eyes. Oh, fantastic! And um, that alone was fun. Um, but what we then also started correlating it towards those results. And what I can say is that in the first row, if people had 2010 vision and they were sitting in the first row very very close, they could see a difference on two out of seven clips. Yeah. <laughs> But even then, the difference was slightly better. It wasn't much better. Oh, no. It, it's, it's not in, different in the way that like um, standard definition to high definition or high definition to 4K, which I think was uh, everyone who looks at this can go like these are either moderate or significant improvements. The difference between the 4K and the 8K is modest. That's true. And what we also noticed, because we did quite some studies afterwards to look into why did these two clips perform better than the others? And it turns out that like high if, frequency you, detail. if you have a lot of high frequency detail, especially in the area where the user is looking, because that's where the story is happening, mm -hmm. then you can actually see the difference, assuming you sit really close and have perfect vision. But other than that, oftentimes, even if you scan it at really high resolutions, there's so much noise going on sometimes it's you don't even see much more high frequency detail so you can't really tell the difference but i tend to be with you where i don't see that happening i mean we're seeing at least on the broadcast side as well it's hard enough to get broadcasters to support 4k to begin with mm -hmm. getting them to do 8k is going to be a real challenge i think that's a bridge too far i, I think that uh you know japan has said we're going 8k not to bring this all back to nhk again but nhk has said 8K, it's 8K or bust. That's what we're doing, 8K. Uh, I think the rest of the world, and I'm, I'm sure that everyone, there's people with 8K displays, that stuff that's being made for that 8K display, that's gonna be 4K. It will be up in the, the set itself to, to the 8K. I don't expect we'll start seeing anyone sending the 8K stuff out to homes because I think frankly, at the end of the day, it's gonna be really hard to tell the difference. Really hard because who wants to, uh, I mean, who really wants to stand uh, about one foot away from their 88 inch screen? Or, I mean, and that, I, at least for me personally, when I went to do the NHK like tech demos that they did at NAB in pre-pandemic days, I stood about three feet from the screen and I could read the text on the water bottle that was very, very small, uh, slightly better than I could on the 4K. I was like, oh, okay, now I, I see what it is. Uh, the limitation factor here is my eyes and it's how far away I am. It is not the quality of the camera. It's not the quality of the screen. It is the, the reality of, of who I am and where I am and the distance that most people are sitting at home across the room or in a theater, they might as well be looking at standard def, I think, most of the time because they are so far away from the screen. So if you know if we can't get to a an understanding of what is actually getting put on the screen, I think there's very little chance that we can also convince consumers that you, they also have to sit at the correct distance in order to, to see these differences. But I think that's a great place for us to leave it. Uh, Mike, thanks so much for being on the show. It really was a lot of fun. And I hope that if uh, you know uh, there's some new breakthrough that you come back and, and tell us about it. Anytime, thanks for having me. All right, that was uh, Michael Zink. Mike, thanks so much for being on the show again. That was, uh, it was really a great conversation and I'm so glad that we got to sit down and have it. I can't wait to find out the latest on Filmmaker Mode and uh, have you back on the show again when there's uh, something new to report. Please put it in my television right now. <laughs> yeah, yes, we'll, we'll all be happier for it. So Ben, it is bill paying time. I know we haven't done too many of those, but we got to thank our fine friends over at Aperture, makers of high quality LED lights for the motion picture industry. They continue to raise the bar, no pun intended, but where I'm going with this is a new product they have called the Infinibar. The Infinibar is a series of three well, lights. You can't raise it higher than infinity, so. That's, that's about as high as it can go. But it's a very clever RGB light that has uh, uh, pixels inside of it, meaning that you can animate the light. So they Whoa. are wonderful for creating lighting effects, but they're also great to put 
on camera in case you know you know you want to have your light prominently featured as is quite popular in music videos and different sorts of things these days the aperture website does have a tremendous amount of montages of people using the infinibar in different situations to create various animated lighting effects hot red cameras has got them in stock and we even have the hard to find four foot kit that has several lights in it and comes in a big hard case so uh, if you're interested in getting hands on these right away and want to come check them out and you're in Los Angeles, uh, reach out to Hot Red Cameras. Hot Red Cameras is stocking these and they've really been impressive and we had a few rental clients uh, immediately pick these up because uh, they are very much in that sort of a music video and lighting effect world where people want to use the lights both for effects on camera as well as effects behind the camera to create all kinds of uh, animated scenes and also uh, I'm aware of now some people using these lights in virtual stage settings, sort of like Mandalorian style, where they want to create the LED wall and lighting effects uh, being in synchronous, being, you know, synced Mm. together. So as your background is changing, your light is changing. So the light on your foreground actors and your scene is also changing all, all in lockstep. And it's a really cool system. There will be a link in the show notes over at Cam Noir for you to go directly to the Hot Red Cameras page and check out what I'm talking talking about and I know that uh, a simple Google search for Infinibar will bring up all kinds of cool crazy stuff that Aperture is, is doing with it. So uh, check out the Infinibar in the one foot, two foot and four foot version and uh, it's it's absolutely worth uh, taking a look. And now short ends. So now it is time for our uh, short end. So now that you've been around the globe and had a couple of weeks to, you know, chill your brain out, what's chewing at your synapses? Wow. Uh, You know, maybe I'm just late to the party, but I decided to give Abbott Elementary a try. Uh, which, of course, just did really well at the Emmys. And I feel like, you know, all the praise is well deserved. I'm only like two and a half episodes in, but... It really made me think back, actually, to The Office, and I know this is intentional because it is a, you know, mockumentary parody sort of style, but it's done really well. And I got to give a shout out to uh, Randall Einhorn, who's been around for a long time, a director, executive producer. He is director, executive producer, um, at least on the first couple episodes I watched of Abbott Elementary, someone I've known for a very long time. Uh, The creator of the show is Quinta Brenson, and holy crap, she's great. She's also the lead in this show. And man, if you liked The Office and Parks and Rec and that sort of clever documentary style, then then this might really be up your alley. I got to say that the first episode, the pilot, I think it tells you everything you need to know sort of about the series and where it's going. And uh, I'd heard a couple, uh, actually, as I was traveling, I was listening to a podcast and the people on the podcast were talking about uh, Abbott Elementary and also sitting down and watching the show with a group of West Philadelphia teachers who were teaching in sort of schools that are essentially like the school that is the the namesake of this series, talking about budget and the personalities that uh, of people who are there. And it turns out, maybe surprisingly, it was really popular with teachers. Teachers really got it. They felt like the voice uh, of the show was from someone who had spent time in the trenches yeah. working in underfunded schools and really sort of like putting their their best foot forward, trying to do the best thing they, they possibly could in these sort of, uh, you know, difficult situations. And I should definitely check it out. I, I, I used to be a substitute teacher once. Yeah, this this might really be your cup of tea. And uh, I got to say that it's fun. Uh, it definitely feels 2023. It feels uh, timely and appropriate. And geez, it's uh, yeah, I, I found myself laughing out loud multiple uh-huh. times during the series and uh, I can't wait to go back to it and get caught up. It's been fun. I shall check that out. That sounds cool. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't feel old fashioned like that stodgy old The Office from the dawn of time. Uh, well, that was like 20 years ago now, Ben. Uh, so, I, um, <laughs> And it's interesting to see how the look and style has changed a bit uh, over time. And I remember The Office being like for free, always sort of in the background of like either Peacock or Netflix. Mm. Uh, I had to subscribe to Peacock to get it now, just so you're aware, because if you were thinking about trying to watch that again, it's now been paywalled. And uh, Mm. I've heard that it's the most downloaded television show in history with more than 56 billion downloads. So yeah, The Office is really, it's become a cultural thing. And a lot of the members of The Office keep 
producing like new little short contents things for YouTube. So it's kind of amazing how that show kind of lives on. But wow. anyway, Abbott Elementary feels reminiscent in a good way and also totally fresh and original, which I appreciate. Excellent. So, Ben, what is your short end? Uh, what, what, are you, uh, what are you about this week? So my short end, I know I've talked about this podcast on the show before, but they just released a new season and it's awesome. It's You Must Remember This, the Karina Longworth podcast, which is always talks about being about the first hundred years of Hollywood history. Last year, she did the erotic 80s series and this year she's doing the erotic 90s. And because of my age, like those are the two decades <laughs> that I was uh, around for that kind of stuff. And, uh, you like, know, like I was uh, nine and a half weeks and that sort of well, uh, is that covered well, that's erotic, that? erotic 80s so that was yeah. last season and i think that i made that a short end a year ago and uh erotic 80s was great yeah she talks about a lot of that and she also talks about a lot of the behind the scenes finagling and karina longworth kind of takes a feminist position on a lot of stuff and so she's gonna tell you the story from the woman's point of view and in general it's kind of galling in general you hear it and you're like what the hell was wrong with people to treat another human being like that all the time yeah I, I mean, like that goes back when you go back and you watch some of this stuff. It's like, but like, I mean, like when she was talking about, like when she did uh, Charles Manson's Hollywood, which mm-hmm. was when I first discovered this podcast years and years ago. You kind of go, okay, so the '60s were all about free love, but of course, it was about, about a bunch of creepy dudes trying to get laid all the time and being jerks about it. But then it's like the '80s, the '90s. I was in my 20s in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I mean, it feels like a long time ago, but it wasn't like the 60s. And I like to think that we were more enlightened than we were. And, you know, when you hear Karina Longworth talking about like, uh, you know, because she's uh, basic three episodes. Instinct. She hasn't gotten to Basic Instinct yet. Okay. Uh, she's three episodes in. The first one just kind of lays the groundwork of it. And then the first episode, believe it or not, was about Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman. Oh, and yeah. kind of oh, yeah. the portrayal of sex work. And she ha- actually had surprisingly good things to say about Pretty Woman as well. I never liked Pretty Woman, not one bit. But I knew that I was in the minority. Anyway, I just think her style of journalism is really well thought out and well researched. And I doubt she's going to do the erotic aughts. I don't really feel like there was a lot of erotic <laughs> thrillers going on. All right. I got a question for you. Did she mention the Blue Lagoon and then the Blue Lagoon remake in the 90s? Because they had the 80s and the 90s. Uh, <laughs> she she hasn't. Well, again, she just got into the erotic 90s, so she hasn't gotten to the remake. But yes, she does a whole episode. I believe the episode about the Blue Lagoon also talks about Porky's. Oh, yeah. Porky's. Of course. Yeah. That was a uh, late yeah, night yeah. Showtime favorite of, uh, you know, teenage Ilya. Yeah. So <laughs> it, uh, a lot of these will make you slightly embarrassed to be a human being. I'm um, sure. You know, and especially when you get into when you think about the portrayal, the way that they're showing sex and the Mm. way that they're showing eroticism and the point of view that it always took. Does Pedro Almodovar get uh, included in this at all? Because he wasn't really American cinema, but, you know. Well, I mean, she talks about regular cinema. I uh, I, she has, I believe, at least name checked Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Mm. Okay. I mean, she talked, I think, about how Time Me Up, Time Me Down was a hit with an X rating and it was like not more explicit than other movies that were getting R ratings. But it was because of sort of the heteronormative version of relationships and sex that were always being put forward. I I think that if you I, I can tell already in the few minutes we've talked about it that you would love both seasons of this. So, yeah, I know that it's a rabbit hole I could fall down and I don't know if I could lose that many hours or, or months. of. It's my not life. that well, just 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 listen oh, okay. to erotic 80s. If you okay. like no, it, I don't need to go back ero- and listen to any of the, the previous stuff. I could just start there. I mean, you can go and listen. There are some stories that she gets into that I'm not as interested in. Like she did one about Hollywood Babylon, the Kenneth Anger book mm. and a fact checking it. She did a whole season fact checking it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really care about any of that. And I just I listened to one or two episodes and moved on. She did uh, one season about Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin. That is is like chef's kiss brilliant brilliant listening like really Mm. just amazing podcasting and uh charles manson's hollywood to me remains one of my favorite seasons of anyone's podcast Hmm. and that had me going off and like i went and watched the antonioni movie zabriskie point that i'd never seen before and it sent me down some rabbit holes because what she did was it wasn't really about charles manson Similarly to the way Once Upon a Time in Hollywood isn't really about Charles Manson. Hmm. It was like Charles Manson was like the temperature of Hollywood and she was doing things around it. So she was talking about the people in his orbit or people like Dennis Hopper, who was apparently a a horrible monster person or Roman Polanski, who was and apparently is kind of not not a great person. I've never heard this before. 
No, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what, what was it wonderful to his wife, who might have been one of the victims yeah, of the Manson family? Exactly. But it actually went into her whole story in a way that I I never really heard it before, and I think it's because Karina Longworth is. She, I I mean, when I say she's taking a feminist perspective, I I feel like she's telling you the whole story. She's telling you the story of the men and the women. You know, like obviously there isn't there there is a feminist angle on Sammy Davis Jr. and Dean Martin, but you're telling the story of these two men. It's but you know it's, it's good. Isn't it good to have a feminist perspective? In, in, Fuck in yeah. Some, I mean, it's like, no, no, no. It's, it's like she, she's a really great journalist and it's really great storytelling. And it's interesting to kind of, uh, you know, because I was I wasn't just alive. I was working in a movie theater when oh, Pretty no. Woman came out. Yeah. You, and, you have and, a real memory of what, uh, you know, what the world was like and, you know, the yeah. worldview at that time. And then to, to have someone else come in with a with a perspective that may not have been your perspective or the way you remember things is actually but also probably, like just kind of reminding us of like oh, how yeah. obsessed the magazine rack was with oh, julia yeah. roberts love life for a long time and you kind of today go like why huh. do we care who julia roberts is dating yeah, like no julia kidding. roberts gets to date whoever she wants to date who gives a crap she's a movie star and it's not the kind of thing that's going to like make you feel uh bad for liking pretty woman or whatever you know like she i don't think she's really there for that but uh i mean i i do think that if you know like when she talked in, in erotic 80s she talks about last tango in paris and that was a pretty disgusting scene mm. but i'll be interested to see what happens when we get to uh basic instinct which she's already teased is going to happen you know because like i have heard rumors about what happened on that set and i'm interested to hear her take on them you know god just sort of the reoccurring themes too between 80s and 90s about how uh the the sex and murder the kink and murder and all of these sort of uh you know fetishization yep. of murder involving sex that was going on in theaters and people you know huge box office hits some of the stuff and you know really uh sucking up all of the water cooler moments for people some of the, these movies so it's oh yeah she, I, she I has a whole episode about fatal attraction she you know like she she goes into a lot a lot of those kinds of things and i'm sure in the 90s she's going to get into stuff like single white female yeah ab- absolutely okay well so oh, you convince me i'm going to give it a shot all right let's go ahead and wrap it up who should we thank tonight let's thank Kay Zalatrachi, who started a- our show off by calling you out hey call me out call me i by the way i just want to make it clear too by the way i offered both of them to come on the show and explain their side like i'm not here to make anyone sound like an idiot so you know, I, I, I would always, especially uh, Kays and Christina are both good friends. I, that was my knee jerk response when Kays is like, you know, you, you misquoted what I said. I was oh, like, you did you did him dirty. He said, come on and tell me what I did wrong. Like you can say it in your own words. We won't even edit them. But uh, yes, thank you, Kays, for your patience, your friendship, and most importantly, your music. Go to musicbykays.com. Hire Kays to score your next movie project. Uh, let's thank our editor, Ben Katz. Ben Katz is chopping, slicing, and dicing, Ooh. possibly reducing the the running time of, uh, of this episode. I, I'm not sure. We not gave sure. him a bloated, bloated whale it's of a, a, little, of a bunch, little, of, little, bunch of yakety. Yeah. I haven't talked to you in two weeks, man. <laughs> I know. it's it's We've made up for it tonight. So, yeah. uh, All right. So, And let's, of course, uh, also thank our producer, Alana Cody, this time lastly, but never leastly. And uh, you can hire Alana to do your podcast uh, production, to produce your podcast, and other forms of social media and optimization you can find her at growwithgreentree.com and uh yeah uh, reach out to her and uh you know give give her all the money that's uh, that's i recommend it or you can send her a fruit basket she'll take a fruit basket yeah, she, too. she likes fruit it's totally possible ben where can people find Very you if they want to they want to find you uh you can find me at benrock.com just paid to renew that website first year down Nice. I just got Ben. If you want to hear the tawdry tale of how I wasn't benrock.com for the first 25 years of the internet, I'll have to go back a few, uh, like probably about You'll a year or so. You'll have to go back about, you know, 40, 50 episodes and we'll, we'll be, yeah. we'll be yakking about it towards the or, end of the or, show. Or just uh, hit me up on Twitter and I'll tell you all about it. But go to benrock.com. You can find links to everywhere you can find me online. Uh, Ilya, how about you? Where can people find you? You can find me at several of these, these socials and uh, LinkedIn. People have been reaching out to me there, but of course, Monday through Friday, either in person or remote, uh, you can find me over at Hot Rod Cameras, hotrodcameras.com. We are in the process of uh, putting together a plan for a studio for someone right now, especially if you are in the market to build a studio, build a shooting space, build a uh, self-tape area, you know, reach out to Hot Rod Cameras, Ooh, me and my self-tape team. Self-tape areas. Oh, yeah, I know a lot. I, I never even occurred to me. I know tons of actors who have to do that. 
Yeah, we we've been uh, building some self tapes. So uh, and uh, we've been working on some green rooms for people as well as some podcasting studios, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, yeah, if you need uh, help in that uh, department, need some help setting it up, need the gear, actually need like major construction and uh, engineering. We work with structural engineers and uh, teams of people for installing lighting grids and all the above. We can definitely help you, too. Excellent. So, Ben, I think it's just going to about do it for this week. Uh, you want to take us out? Thanks for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.